afternoon, whatever time of day it is that you are listening, folks. Thank you very, very much for listening. Day today is the 18th of March, year of our Lord 2024. Welcome to yet another edition of The Coping Hour, hosted by Nicholas Inkle, a.k.a. Motown Noah. Mustache season is officially in full swing. Uh, for those of you who don't know what my calendar is for my facial hair, is as soon as the first day of spring is around the corner, which uh, as of this recording is tomorrow, Tuesday the 19th, will be the first day of spring here in the United States. Is it all of North America or is it surely it's just the United States? How does that work? How does the how does the how does the earth spinning on its axis uh, work as it pertains to the seasons around the world? Because I know when it's winter for us and it's Christmas, it's summer in some parts of the world because they're because as as we turn away from the sun, that just means that somebody on the opposite side of the world turns up towards the sun. Is it only the first day of spring in the United States? Someone let me know how that works. Probably could have uh, looked that up. No, but how it works for me is that's when it's time to do the mustache. So for the spring and the summer, I like to have a mustache. And then as soon as football season starts, that's when I grow the beard out. And then for the whole winter, I have a beard. And then uh, the cycle repeats. So we're back. Mustache Town Noah back on the menu. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I want to talk a little bit about NFL free agency today. We actually got an email that I kind of wanted to jump into, and then it immediately got nixed. Um, it was about Justin Fields uh, from a nice little Bears fan. Kind of the main storyline of these last few days. In what's otherwise been, like, the NFL free agency period has kind of verged on this league territory because it seems like every 15 minutes for the last, like, week and a half, there has been a major storyline that's dropped. The most recent one is Justin Fields getting traded to the Pittsburgh Steelers in exchange for a conditional sixth-round pick that could convey to a fourth-round pick depending on how much playing time he gets. I, I may have that backwards, but I believe that's what it is. Um, this is notable, of course, because the Steelers, uh, within a, a week span, signed Russell Wilson after he was subsequently uh, subsequently signed Russell Wilson after being released by the Denver Broncos and then traded Kenny Pickett, who was their starter of the last few years, to the Philadelphia Eagles so he can back up Jalen Hurts. Okay, Steelers quarterback room getting a little bit thin. And then the Steelers say to us, hey, that Justin Fields carousel, nobody's really sure at this point where he's going to go. Like all the two, oh, Atlanta, well, Kirk Cousins, nope. What, are they going to trade him to Denver? It's like, no, they just traded like Jerry Judy. Like what are they going to do? Was he going to go to the Raiders? I don't know. They got AOC playing quarterback, and then who didn't they just pick somebody up uh, to be a backup? I don't remember who who it was. And then it was like, well, maybe he'll go to Minnesota. It's like he's not going to go to Minnesota, though, because Minnesota just traded up. So now they have two first-round picks. It's like they're going after J.J. McCarthy or, or, or somebody else, right? They're going after a quarterback. Okay, all right, so it's not going to be them. Jimmy G goes to the goes to the Rams to be Stafford's backup. Like, okay, where is Justin Fields supposed to go? Where does he fit in all this? Apparently, he fits in with the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, and the Steelers, I believe, ended up getting more for Penny Kenny Pickett than they had to give up for Justin Fields. That's really the conversation here. But before we jump into that, I do want to. Usually, we don't read emails like in the in the very beginning of the show. Usually, I kind of uh, give myself like fifteen to twenty minutes to just kind of recap some stuff that I want to talk about. But I do think that what this guy said is is really important. So let me set the stage a little bit. The drama with this Justin Fields stuff really comes down to the, the two camps that there have been through this entire process and through his entire tenure with the Chicago Bears. There are the people who go hard in the motherfucking paint for that guy. Um, some of them sneaky aren't even Bears fans. They're just like Ohio State fans. Like, oh, okay, whatever. But there are Bears fans who, like, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Justin Fields, is their shepherd. You know what I mean? And then you have the inverse of that, which is guys who are just like, yeah, he's fine. Like, he's a fine NFL quarterback. But also, I fucking want Caleb Williams. Okay? So, let's jump into this email from Jackson. And this email came in, I think, a day or two before the Fields trade. Okay? So, there's your context. The, the, the trade had not happened yet. It was just all that anybody was talking about. From Jackson. Jackson, welcome to the show. Subject line, give Fields the key to the city. Hey, Nick, another great episode today. I wanted to get your thoughts on this whole Chicago Bears QB situation, especially with the pickup of Keenan Allen. I feel like everyone in the media is talking about the Bears taking Williams and giving up on fields. I get so angry at those in the Williams camp. His family is crazy. He's full of himself. USC had a bad year, and only two Heisman quarterbacks have ever won the Super Bowl. Two. I cannot explain the amount of disdain I have for Williams. I cannot stand the disrespect of Fields' name. I think the great poet Chief Keefe said it best. When, I'm not reading this. You think I can read that word on this show? How the fuck am I supposed to censor myself? Not censor myself like I can't fucking help myself, but what am I supposed to do 
with this quote. Chief Keefe said something that uh, uh, beautifully pertains to the situation. That's all I'll say. That's how I feel in one sentence. Additionally, why invest in a quarterback with how the O-line is? It'll ruin the quarterback. It'll be Trubisky and Fields, as some say, even though he's been great with our piss poor O-line, all over again. Also, oh, and then he just goes into a different thing. So I thought it was important to highlight that email so that you could, because here at the Coping Hour, we love to, essentially that's the essence of the show is is covering the most deluded fans, right? And and seeing as many perspectives of a fan base as we possibly can. This is the one that we get the most from from Bears fans is the is the camp who is like overly pro Justin Fields to the point where, and I'm not saying this guy was, was, in, this, uh, was in this camp. I think he seems reasonable enough. Bears fans were like, oh, like, we got to get like a second. We got to get a third round pick for Justin Fields. Like, okay, maybe you will, right? Because valuing quarterbacks in 2024 is really difficult. Um, the people, which first of all, and two things can be true. One, he didn't deserve that. But a sixth, a single sixth round pick for Justin Fields feels bananas. It feels disrespectful. It feels like clown shit on the Bears end, right? That just feels like poor asset management. Because even if you didn't touch him now, and you a quarterback's going to go down this fall. They will, right? Like they just will. And even if you held on to him just a little bit longer, you pretend like there's going to be some QB competition. I don't know if maybe that's just bad for like the chemistry of the team. Um, you know, Hey, I'm not, a, I'm not a team building guru, but it just feels like at some point, you know, it, even if it was in the past and, and you held your cards too long in this situation, what, what I guess frustrates me a little bit is when people are like, oh, armchair GMs thought that Justin Fields was going to get more than this. Yeah, man, I think we all did a little bit, though, right? And I don't think that's like armchair GMing and people being like, oh, so you think you know how to value a quarterback better than these general managers? Uh, some of us do in some sense, right? But there's not this blind attachment to them. Um, you know, a lot of us wouldn't have handed out that Russell Wilson contract from like not that long ago that the Broncos ended up doing, right? A lot of us wouldn't have done that, you know? Hey, Patrick Mahomes wasn't the first quarterback taken that year that he got drafted. Neither was Josh Allen. You know what I mean? So I would argue that a lot of these, I think, I think Darnold went above Josh Allen, right? I may have that wrong, but in some sense, it was uh, like two quarterbacks went before Josh Allen. So, you know, Deshaun Watson, hey, there's another one. Just have to, just to derail myself into, uh, you know, moving on from this. Deshaun Watson, there's another contract that a lot of us are probably like, I wouldn't have done that. No, I wouldn't have done that. Not after, not immediately after you know, all this stuff comes out about him, probably the worst contract in the history of the NFL, if we're being honest about it. So I think it sucks, man. I think it sucks if you're a Bears fan to an extent, because if you, you know, once you take the blinders off and you'd be for, for real about it for like five minutes, you're like, okay, we're getting Caleb Williams. <laughs> oh no, we're getting Caleb Williams. Like, oh no, you're going to be fine. Right. I think in my head, I had convinced myself, like, what if they, the extra medium zag here would to just keep the first overall pick and Justin Fields, let everybody think you're taking Caleb, then take Marvin Harrison, and then you're just chilling. I mean, the receiver room would have gotten a little bit crammed. You have Mooney, you have Keenan Allen, or didn't Mooney go somewhere else? I don't think they have him anymore. You have Keenan Allen, you have DJ Moore, you have Marvin Harrison. Like, I don't know. No, that would have been sick. And then for tight end, they have Cole Komet and Gerald Everett. Huh? They're nasty. Like, the Bears have weapons. And I think what's going to be interesting for Caleb Williams – in his first year is he's going to learn pretty quick that he can't just sit in the pocket for 10 seconds, drop back, drop back, drop back, and then wait for the 45 yard bomb. He just can't do that. Right. Especially to this guy's point with the bears offensive line, because for everything, and this is just as of this recording, Hey, who knows, maybe they're going to bolster it. But as of this recording, it's like, that's the one thing that the bears just haven't really seemed to touch. And uh, Hey, maybe Lake and Tomlinson walks through that door. Like, I guess that's something cool. Some people thought they were going to go after Jonah Jackson. And then the Rams were like, no, -uh, we are. So I'm a little bit pissed about that. I think we ended up uh, resigning Graham, Graham uh, Glasgow anyways. Like, Hey, whatever. Would have loved to have kept Jonah. Um, yeah. It's, it's weird for bears fans, man. Cause there was, there was definitely a, a middle ground to be achieved with, you know, how good he actually was. He's an NFL quarterback. I think he is. I really think he is, but I think here's what sucks. Here's what sucks. So you're putting Russell Wilson, a guy who is historically been at his best when he's in play action, rolling outside of the pocket. You, you have a guy like Justin Fields who is as dynamic as he is and can really play all over the field. But you know, it's really once you get him out of contain that it's kind of like, all right, once he breaks contain, it's like, what's Justin Fields going to do? You're putting those two quarterbacks in an offense orchestrated by Arthur Smith who is like obsessed with playing in the middle of the field. 
And that's why it never worked with Desmond Ritter. It's why it never worked with Marcus Mariota. It's why it didn't work with Taylor Heineke. There are a myriad of reasons why it didn't work. None of those guys are NFL quarterbacks. Uh, Mariota has been in his career, but with Ritter, it's like, what the fuck are we? Heineke, yeah, I guess he, he, he like, put that shit on with, like, the fucking commanders. But, like, no. Like, come on. What are we doing? You know, it, it's astounding to have an offense with, like, B. John Robinson and Kyle Pitts and, and Drake London and all these different guys. Tyler Algier, Tyler Algier kind of in there. And to just not be able to move the football is astonishing. And so now you just give that guy Justin Fields and and, and Russell Wilson. And, and it's over for Russ. And I agree, or not agree, I, rather I believe when Mike Tomlin is like, no, like, hey, Russ is going to be our starter day one. Um, I believe that, but we're all, what, 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 are, we, what are we thinking? I, by week eight, it's Justin Fields. Right. If it's not sooner than that, I think it's going to be somewhere between like week seven and week 10. I'm going to go with week eight here. So that's what I got on the Bears. I guess if I have to give an immediate, uh, an official stance on where I'm at with it, uh, it sucks short term. It's going to suck for Bears fans if it happens somewhere else for Justin Fields. That's not going to feel good, especially, especially when it was only for a conditional sixth round pick. What? Uh, but you're getting Caleb Williams. And, hey, only two Heisman quarterbacks have ever won a Super Bowl, to that guy's point. But there's going to be a third at some point, right? Why not Caleb? Why not Caleb? Crazy, crazy uh, offseason for the NFL. I think my favorite trade so far, you just don't get to see, you just do not get to see the player-for-player swap anymore. And when you do see it, it's like you don't, it's just not really interesting players. But getting to... (laughs) Desmond Ritter for Rondale Moore. Oh my God, I love it. And you want to talk about the 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 Falcons loading up on some weapons? Absolutely love it. Rondale Moore kind of had a weird career so far. I think some of that is just be, you know Kyler Murray's his quarterback. The fuck is he supposed to do? And every season seems to have had that he's been in the NFL seems to have like two or three plays a year that are like legitimate highlight reel plays. So I'm excited him excited for him to get to play in an actual NFL offense with a real NFL quarterback, a 35 year old Kirk Cousins. Uh, once again, just making a shit ton of money. Love it for Kirk. And then you look at the Chiefs. Talk about another guy, Hollywood Brown, going to the Chiefs, whose career has been kind of weird. Well, some of that has been, what, the last two years he's been quarterbacked by Kyler Murray and, like, Josh Dobbs and then David Blau, like, whoever the Cardinals can throw in there at quarterback, right? And he was a guy who the Lamar and the Ravens, they, the players were pissed that he got traded from Baltimore. He, they didn't want that to happen. They were like, no, please keep this dude around. The Ravens were like, hell no. And, and you've been kind of waiting for the Chiefs to do this upgrade at receiver. You're like, what are they going to do? I don't think they need to do one at running back, but, like, how cool would it be if they went after, like, uh, I was trying to think of somebody off the top of my head. I don't know. If they drafted, like, Blake Corum or something, that would be so sick. But I think the Chargers are going to go after Blake Corum, honestly, him and, like, Roman Wilson. I think we're all waiting for the Chiefs to do that big wide receiver upgrade. I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know if they have the means to do it. Did it feel like Hollywood Brown was, like, the move for it? Um I think he supplements, like, Kadarius Tony and, like, MVS, right? I mean, Kadarius Tony was a complete zero for most of the season. It didn't really matter. It's not that hard to replace him with MVS. It's like, I don't, I don't know. I guess he did have some big moments in that Super Bowl, didn't he? <laughs> Wasn't he the one who caught the pass? Was that him? I don't remember who it was. I'm not going to pretend to remember. It's crazy that a month and a half will go by, and it's like the Super Bowl didn't even happen. I know the Chiefs won, and I know they won on the last play of the game in overtime. Well, not the last play of the game, but they won in overtime on a walk-off, right? I don't really remember anything else about that moment other than uh, Tony Romo fucked up Jim Nance's call. So I'm just kind of waiting because it's like the Chiefs are just going to do it. They're just going to do it again. At this point, it's like the Denver Nuggets and the Kansas City Chiefs. It's like the same picture where you're just kind of like, okay, so it's just going to be them. Oh, so this is just what we're doing. But what's weird to me, though, is it just doesn't feel like there's not – it doesn't feel like the fatigue is there. With Denver, I think it's only because it happened once. If it happens again, I think people will kind of start to turn on Denver. With the Chiefs, it, it, it happened after they won one because it's it just through virtue of it being Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and, and Andy Reid. And it's like you can't even – you can't watch a Chiefs game, much less any NFL game, without them cutting to commercial. And at least six times throughout the duration of the game, uh, the broadcast will show like six State Farm commercials. With the three of those guys, or if not the three of them, then like just Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey or something like that. I think people, there's just some fatigue there. And where I was going with that is I was like, remember when, remember when Cleveland and Golden State played in the finals for like four straight years and 
the first one was like it was just cool, and then the second one was Cleveland coming back from three one. And so they got them back. All right, well, the series is – the final series is like one-to-one one now. You each got one, right? So you go into 2017, the first year with Kevin Durant. No, uh, it was over. Like it was over after that, right? And then they had – it was one more after that, right? It was just over both times. Which year was it? It would, So it wouldn't have been after – so, okay, so the, the Warriors go up like two-to-one in the final series. They win in 2017. And then it was 2018 that LeBron plays the best season of his entire career. Uh, he's wearing the LeBron 15s. They take – the, 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 like, rookie, was it? No, surely he couldn't have been a rookie that year. Was Tatum a rookie the year that they took Cleveland to seven games in the conference finals? And he dunked on LeBron and was like, I had a poster of him, like, in, like, high school or even at Duke. I don't remember what it was. But he was like, and now I'm, like, literally putting him on a poster. No way that was Jason Tatum's rookie year, but that would have been 17-18, right? And, and Tatum would have been drafted in 17, so holy shit. So they get through that, and it's a series where LeBron is just turning into like an oral history of like my favorite LeBron season ever. So the first series was the one against Indiana, and he hits that buzzer beater in like game five. Everybody made this big deal about the shot. And then the next series was LeBronto, right? And he's hitting that crazy shit going baseline, one-handed off the glass at the buzzer, game three. And then they do the Boston thing. And then he comes out game one against Golden State, and it's like, is it? Can it happen this year? I think that was also the same year, if memory serves, on the on the Western Conference side of things, that Houston had just come off of missing twenty seven consecutive threes in Game Seven of the Western Conference Finals. It was a Game Six. I think that one was. I think that one also went seven games. But Houston had just missed twenty seven straight. I believe this was all in the same year. So there's like shit. There are storylines to follow here. Okay, we go to the NBA Finals, and what happens in Game One? LeBron played. Of my lifetime, up to that point, the most dominant game in an NBA Finals that I've ever seen, with my eyes that I've ever been able to see. He puts up 50, and then at the end of the game, it's the J.R. Smith game. It's the J.R. Smith forgetting the time, forgetting the score, and fucking it all up. As soon as that game went into overtime, you're like, it's over. It's over. And it sucked because for a series that we already knew was over, the fact that LeBron was able to make it a game for 48 minutes— and as soon as it as it ended in Golden State, I think they went on like a 10-0 run in overtime. It was just over. There's just no way. It's game one and the finals are already over. You just know there's no way. There's no way that they could come back from that. Where the fuck was I going with all of that? Why did I just bring all of that up? Did I bring all of that up just to talk about Jalen Brunson for a minute? Because when you talk about a guy, that a term that I've been seeing a lot this season specifically that I'm actually kind of on board with and I really enjoy, ethical buckets – when you talk about guys in the NBA who are high point scorers and they do it in the most, again, ethical and organic way, they're not getting to the line. Like they're just fucking hooping out there. When you think about all the guys in the NBA who, who can fit into that list, Jalen Brunson is up there. I think in, in my lifetime, the most like if we're talking about like ethical hoopers, right? Guys who are, you know, 20 to 25 point a game scores and as few of those points as possible come from the line. I think Kyrie Irving is probably the most like dude, that guy just goes out there and he just he just gets buckets like that's all that he does. But the reason I want to highlight Brunson for a minute here is because the Knicks play this game against Sacramento, and they only score 98 points. Brunson has 42 of them. Huh? Was it Stephen A. Smith that had the whole take about, I don't know if there's been a better signing like in Knicks history than Jalen Brunson. I don't know if we've, again, if you know, when, when I talk about, I don't know if we've ever seen, I just mean, I don't know if I've been alive for it a Knicks player that is as that is a star player for the Knicks that is as uh universally loved and as like undivisive as Jalen Brunson is and I think the the conversation about him in terms of uh what makes him so effective on a, on the basketball court is usually about his footwork you always see something about that I hey I don't know I don't, I don't know anything about that all I know is he goes out there and he like does these crazy little step backs and then my favorite thing about him I love when I love players who can do this is they like put a shoulder down and they drive to the hoop and they don't even it's not really a floater they just kind of like flip it up 
they just kind of like twitch their wrist and the ball just kind of it's like a, it is a floater but like it just happens so fast and then the ball before you even realize that it went up is just at the bottom of the net uh if, it, it, guys off the top of my head oh, that's another one honestly that Kyrie's really good at uh Reggie Jackson probably the best in the league at that sneaky like just getting those sneaky floaters off Luca can throw some in there LeBron's too big to do it Steph actually likes to do like the he loves doing like the little rainbow shot floater I wouldn't really put him in there either but Brunson is on the list and I want to talk about this uh hey it's not a numbers podcast right but I want to talk about this post I saw on Reddit a few weeks ago um the data might be a little bit uh, skewed now this is from 17 days ago but I do think this is worth highlighting if there are any differences it's going to be marginal anyways 25 plus point per game scores this season and how much of their points come from free throws like percentage wise uh Joel Embiid 30% of his points come from the line. Shea Gilgis-Alexander, 25.3. Trey Young, 25.2. Giannis, 23.8. And Devin Booker at 22.5. So those are the top five of 25-plus point-per-game scores whose uh, a, a majority of their points are coming from the line. If we look at the bottom five, Jokic at 17.5. De'Aaron Fox at 16.9. Steph Curry at 16.7, LeBron at 15.6, and Kyrie Irving right at the bottom, 12.7% of his, only 12% of his 25 are coming from the line. So that's what I'm talking about, man. There's actually, there's like actually for once empirical evidence to suggest that something that I'm saying is true. It's not just a vibes thing. Where's Brunson in that? Literally right dead middle of the pack at 19.7 though, right? So that's not a thing. And hey, I'm kind of bearing the lead because that's, that, hell, that's part of what I'm talking about here is that he has uh, 42 of the Knicks 98 points for free throws. Huh? Huh? When was the last time you saw New York Nick carry a team like this? Fucking Lynn Sanity? I'm being serious. When? When was it? Like, on the level that he does it, as consistently as he does it, and all of this is happening because why? Because Mark Cuban was like $15 million for Jalen Brunson? Hell no. Hell no. I'm sure there was more nuance to that situation than I just, uh, hey, I didn't, I don't know. But on the surface, we can look back and uh, if we want to be reductive, that's all we have to say, right? Is, is, Is the best thing to happen in Knicks history that Jalen, that Mark Cuban didn't want to pay Jalen Brunson. We got to talk about it, because I don't know if there's a worse thing for NBA fans. That the Knicks, for coming up on like five years now, have been a competently run organization. You bring Leon Rose in the building, and suddenly the Knicks aren't fucking around. Hell, it was like, I think it was uh, late last week, early last week, that it was like the 10-year anniversary of the Knicks hiring Phil Jackson. Remember that? Dog, I was in like middle school, high school, when that, early high school, I think, when that happened. And I remember the, the world was falling. Old heads couldn't believe that Phil Jackson was back in the game. And we're all sitting here like, all right, cool. Like, show me something, Phil. The last time I had heard from Phil Jackson was, I guess it, it hadn't been that long. It had only technically been like six years since he had left the Lakers. And it hadn't really been that long. But it's like, all right, cool. How did that end? How did that go? So the fact that the Knicks, I mean, dog, this is going to sound dumb, but coming from me, you guys know how much I love Dante DiVincenzo. That was like a, that was a real signal to me that they were taking this shit seriously. I, I was like, I can take Jalen Brunson. I can take him or leave him. Like, yeah, he's cool. Like, whatever. Brunson, Dante DiVincenzo is a role player? All right. Tibbs knows what he's doing. Tibbs knows how to use a guy like that, right? A, a guy who is a, he's a hustle player. He'll play big minutes if he has to. He'll dive on the floor for a loose ball and he'll knock down like three or four threes in a game. That's just what he does. The OG and Anobi trade, by all accounts, one of the more effective ones that we've seen in the NBA this season, honestly. So there's a lot to be said about how well these Knicks are run and how well they operate. You know, it sucks. Honestly, I hate it. I hate it a ton. And I say all this just to say, respectfully, no. No, not this year. It can't happen. It just, it cannot happen. Unless Jalen Brown, I I don't even think there's a world where, you know, because he can't do this in the playoffs. Not saying he's incapable of doing it in the playoffs, but you can't do this for seven games. You just can't. You're going to do that against Boston, Jalen Brunson? You're not, though, because Derek White, at at best, will allow you to get away with this horse shit for one game. You would be lucky to get a full 35 minutes of Jalen Brunson doing this horse shittery for one game against the Celtics. Derek White's going to get on his jersey. It's just not going to happen. 
oh, Jalen Brunson is like blowing past Derek White. That's fine. They'll just be like, all right, Tatum, like get up there, J. One of the Jays, honestly. Although that's gonna create a mismatch elsewhere, and then Jalen Brunson is just gonna be like playmaking maestro, and he's gonna throw some like behind his head shit. That's something I'd like to see more from Jalen Brunson, just as like a just as a guy who loves being uh, entertained by the NBA is if Jalen Brunson could add more, like, ridiculous... Can Jalen Brunson learn the elbow pass? There we go. That would make me... I, w- I will go full Jalen Brunson MVP in 2025 if Jalen Brunson learns how to do an elbow pass. You want to talk about NBA... I didn't even plan on doing this, the what I'm about to start talking about, so this might go off the rails, and I might, sound st- I might say something I don't mean, so just stay with me because I didn't plan this at all. But this is coming to me in real time. It's, it's the dog days of the NBA season. We're kind of just like, all right, let's just get there. And, you know, what What do people want to talk about right now? Um, yeah, like, the, the play-in race is cool. Like, what's going to happen there? Um, but it's, like, MVP and, like, people want to talk about awards right now is really all that it is, right? All right, well, we do the MVP thing, like, all the time. Everybody loves to talk about the MVP. Makes sense. It's the most important award. Defensive player of the year. Yeah, there's been some fun quotes about that because, like, a French reporter asked Victor, like, hey, you know, Rudy Gobert. And he was like, yeah, Rudy can win this year. Like, that's cool. Because, like, after this year, he's, like, never going to win one again. Bar. Love it. Love that shit from Victor. And But what else are people talking about? Most improved? You don't really hear that much about that. There have been – and I, I'm being fair here. I, there have been plenty of years where people care about who wins most improved player. Uh, the year that Brandon Ingram won it, I was like – that did happen, right? I'm not – I'm not – that's not – I'm not false memorying that, right? I remember being – oh, my God, dude. I was, I was like, thinking about – applying to like write for a Pelican's blog because I was like Brandon Ingram might be the best player I've ever seen in my life and he's really really good but I can look back on them all right Nick relax what are we talking about for six man of the year though it's kind of where I wanted to get with that that's one that do you guys remember that like stretch where every year it was like oh who's six man gonna go to what's Lou Williams doing it's like what's Eric Gordon doing oh it's just gonna be one oh okay all right cool Malik Monk, is that is that who we're going with this year? Malik Monk. Maybe I should look into those odds. I've been looking at the MVP odds, but notice Anthony Edwards slowly creeping up. Think about like a week and a half ago, he's plus twenty thousand. He's plus fifteen thousand now. Hmm. Hmm. Timberwolves fans, fans, you got a little bit frustrated with me when I started doing like an Anthony Edwards MVP case the other day, and you were, and you guys were like, I wish people would not talk about the Timberwolves until we're actually ready to be talked about. That's totally valid. That's totally fair. I hope you guys know. When I talk about Minnesota, because you guys aren't doing shit in the playoffs, hey, level the playing field here just so I'm not being too nice. You're not. But but this year, hey, you want to talk about when they're ready. When I talk about Anthony Edwards, it's more like – it's more out of like an admiration and more of like a, damn, I wish I had that. Like – I don't know if there's a player or not. Nah, I was going to I see this is what I was saying. I'm going to about to say something I don't mean. I was going to be like, I, would I rather have Anthony Edwards than like Jason Tatum? I could talk myself into it if I needed to lie about it, but I don't know. I don't. Can I give you guys a take? I, I was, I've was i been tr- really trying to think about how I can do a segment about where I just get off a bunch of takes that I don't mean. But if you say them, it's easy to convince yourself that it's real. But as soon as you, you know, you really start to peel back, you're like, what are you talking about? That's not a real thing. And just to give you an idea of the, the take that I, that gave me this idea for this segment, this fictional segment that that's never going to happen. So I might as well just burn the take somewhere, right? I was like, Drew Holiday deserves a statue more than Chris Middleton. And I was only, th- and neither of them deserve a statue. Hold on. Record scratch freeze frame. You're probably wondering how I got here. Neither of them deserve a statue. But just since everybody's been talking about statues and bullshit lately, ooh, where does LeBron deserve one the most? And 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 Kobe's statue getting fucked up with a bunch of uh, you know misspellings and stuff like that. It's just kind of on my mind. And the reason I was thinking, I was like, well, yeah, Chris Middleton like is sort of a Bucks lifer. Like, yeah, the shit he did with the Pistons, but like that doesn't count. He's a Milwaukee Buck, right? Yeah, and like historic. Celtic killer, like generational Celtic killer, Chris Middleton, 100%. But Drew threw the lob. He threw the lob, right? He threw the lob herd around the world. That's not Chris Middleton's fault, but Drew Holiday did that shit. 
right? And then you really start to think about it. No, obviously Drew Holiday does not deserve a statue. But you know what I mean? There's a there's a there's a way to get some takes off that you don't mean, but they're just kind of fun. They're kind of whimsical. I could probably think of like five or six of those. What's going on with Chris Middleton? I don't know if there's a when he's back, man, when he's when he is just like getting his shit off. I don't know if there's a more visually satisfying bucket getter in the league. Cause there's a difference between like ethical hoopers and like aesthetically pleasing bucket getters. Right? I mentioned Kyrie earlier. He does fall into this list too. Kevin Durant falls into this list. Does Steph fall into the list though? Because I feel like half the shit he takes is an ethical. I feel like if there was a way to track how many, like what the percentage of the shots that Steph has taken in his career have just been bad shots, what's the, you know what I mean? It's not half. It's just, it's not. There are plenty of like it, it, like open threes and him creating some space, doing some shit off the ball, catching the ball off a screen. Um, I don't know catching the ball off like a cut going to the basket easy lay and like it, the, the majority of his but but I just think like bad shots per capita he would probably lead NBA history a because he takes as many as he does and b I don't think there's anybody who can who can get shots off you know who sneaky might have been number one honestly is mellow because I for a dude who could get a shot off in a phone booth it seemed like that's all he wanted to do was Carmelo taking like a 15-footer either in somebody's face who had a hand up or he's 18 feet away. Probably should maybe reverse the numbers. It's also not that important. Doing like a – he's like backing a dude down and he'll do like a quick little turnaround or something. Carmelo Anthony took like historically bad shots. They just went in all the time. I think as, you know, as time moves along here – the further we removed that we get from that Dame shot against Oklahoma City and Paul George being like, I don't care what anybody says, that's a bad shot. Dog, we murdered him for that. We murdered him for that. But he was right, though. But he was right, though. And I do agree. I think I think people have come around on that, and I think they actually did pretty early on. Like, the, It's not that Paul George was wrong to say that it was a bad shot. It was to say that in that moment – you just looked bitter as fuck. But guess what, motherfucker? If a dude hit that shot, not just like on my team as a fan, on me, if I'm Paul George, I'm fighting for my life. Because that's you're seeing that everywhere for the rest. That's like an all-time iconic, not just NBA moment, like sports moment. To hit a shot that crazy when the stakes were that high. You bet your ass I am getting in front of a microphone 10 minutes later being like, I don't care what anybody says. That was a bad shot. That shot sucked. It just went in, right? Just because the shot goes in doesn't mean it's a bad shot. It's kind of like in football, your team, your favorite team goes for it on fourth down, right? What happens if they get the, if they get the play? They get the first down. It was a great call by the coach. The same circumstances, they run the exact same play but they don't get it. It was a bad call and the coach needs to be fired. We are victims. We are slaves to the, the moment, right? Don't be a prisoner of the moment and the, the, the ifs and fifths and we'd all be drunk right now. Big open for you guys today. Holy smokes. Let's move on. Coping our subs at gmail.com is the email to the show spelled out phonetically. Uh, The email will always be available in the description of wherever it is that you listen to the show. We got an email from Dylan, uh, Dylan, welcome to the show. We talk about Vegas a lot. We talk about the expansion a lot. Um, I'm not even going to focus too much on the email here specifically. I kind of want to go off on a little bit of a tangent uh, elsewhere. I don't know how long it's going to take. It could be three minutes. could be seven minutes. I don't know. We'll see where it goes. Um, let me read the email first. Subject line, Las Vegas Sports Rant. Hey, Nick. First off, congrats on the baby. Can't wait for your LeVar Ball arc in 15 years. Thank you very much. I'm writing you to ask why you think the NBA hasn't expanded to Vegas yet. And I guess we can throw Seattle in there too because I think they will expand at the same time. I was born and raised in Las Vegas and have heard, Vegas is next, for so long now. After all this time, it's honestly pissing me off. Why aren't we doing this? What aren't we doing to prove that we are worthy? Summer League is always a great time. The Aces sell out a ton of games. The Golden Knights are a huge hit. The Raiders games are always packed, even though they suck. He said that, not me. 
And now we have the A's getting ready to come over. The NBA even has a preseason game here every year. And at this point, it's been 20 years since the last expansion. And I think the league is due for it. There is already so much talent in the league. And there are guys that aren't getting the opportunity opportunity they deserve. Um, and guys that aren't getting the opportunity, Jesus, Nick, that aren't getting the opportunity they deserve could have a better place on their own team. I'm looking directly at you, Jaden Hardy. Please come home. Is he from Vegas? Nice. You guys can get, like, Jimmy Kimmel to own the team or something. And don't try to tell me it's because they couldn't handle Vegas. I don't think anybody would say that. I've heard all about the fallout from the All-Star game, but in my opinion, that's honestly bullshit. Side note, I'm a LeBron fan, and the idea of him owning a team here makes me want to actually freak out. I don't know if I'm just really... I I can't read today. I can't read today. I'm illiterate today. I'm going to stop reading there. I just can't read this. It's not you, Dylan. It's literally me. I just can't read today. He wants to know what the fuck's going on. We've talked about this a handful of times on this show. I don't want to spend too much time on it, um, but the art of repeating yourself for people who maybe are new listen- listeners to the show, it's important. When is Las Vegas going to happen? When is the NBA going to expand? I believe it's next year that the the TV deal is up in the NBA. That's when it's going to happen. That's when the ball is going to start to get rolling. So, like, actually, though, it is going to happen soon. Um, I did, uh, Dylan, I uh, go ahead and check your inbox. I did send you a quick little TR, TLDR about this the other day because I didn't think I was going to talk about it on the show, but such is life. Here we are. Uh, I might, I, you kind of sent me into a rabbit hole. And I, again, I have something I want to mention here. But, yeah, when, when the TV deal is up and they renegotiate that, the ball is going to start to get rolling on – two expansion teams it's going to be seattle and it's going to be vegas people always love to think like i get it's fun to make jokes about like bad nba teams like detroit and it's like oh they're going to turn into the seattle super i don't know when the next time a team is going to relocate is i would be shocked if it's by the end of the decade though like barring a financial crisis i don't think a team is going to be forced to relocate or if or if i think the only other uh, outcome is uh because i hey i'm not up on the lease agreements with these teams and their arenas um, but that was something that New Orleans was struggling with at the end of the last decade. They were the Smoothie King Center, like they just couldn't get an agreement on a lease. And so people thought that, especially with Anthony Davis getting traded out, that the Pels were going to have to move. And then, ooh, the lottery balls just so happened to fall in New Orleans' favor, and they get Zion Williamson, and suddenly the, suddenly they don't have to fucking move. Hmm, Gail Benson, uh, the devil works hard, but Gail Benson works harder, I guess. It's not going to be a team relocating that gives us Seattle or that gives us Vegas. It's it's going to be this new TV deal, and they're going to expand the league out to two teams. And those are the two cities that they're going to go to. And it's going to be awesome. Here's what I want to talk about. Is this what we de- desperately need in the, NBA, in the NBA is for not just an expansion draft to happen, but for two teams to be expanded and to really dilute this talent pool in a way that I think – I don't want to say flips the league on its head, but it's not nothing when you have two teams stripping the league for parts. What happened to the Pistons with Rick Mahorn, right? Well, we ended up winning a championship the following season, so it didn't really ended up mattering that much. But the point still remains, right, that it can be a problem. And I'm going to be curious to see. It's been a while, admittedly, since I've looked into what the protections actually are for expansion, do you get to, is it like seven or eight guys that you get to protect? Or is it like 10 that you get to protect? It, it, there's, it has to only be like seven or eight. And I think what's what, what becomes the most fun in, in this situation is teams that don't protect certain guys, not because they're good, but because their contract sucks. And if another team wants to take that off their hands, more power to them, right? I think it'll be really healthy for the NBA when this happens because we're going to see player movement happen. In a, and I also just selfishly, man, for at least a year or until they kind of start to get good, I don't know how long it's going to take, we're all going to root for Seattle. We are. It's going to be the people's team. The, the buzz surrounding that team, and I can't even imagine what those games are going to look like in Seattle, what those Sonics games are going to look like. The funniest thing that the NBA could do, you know, whatever uh, whatever group is like the majority stakeholder for this for this Seattle franchise, is it is it Bezos? Is that Or is that too easy? Is that too easy to think that it's going to be Bezos and there's no way that it's going to be him? The funniest thing that could happen is they move this team to Seattle. They're not called the Sonics. Or they are called the Sonics, and their colors are like blue and gold. And they just totally fuck it up, and it's just not what anybody wants. That that would just be the—and I say funny now. 
I say funny now, if and when something like that happens, where it's not exactly what we want, they don't just do the supersonic thing exactly the way they should. Don't include red. God, rancid. Rancid. I do not want, like, mid-90s, like, Gary Payton, like, green, yellow, and red supersonics. No, no. Please do, like, the Kevin Durant. Like, green and yellow supersonics. Please just do that. But, like, modernize that shit. Although, there's a problem. There's, like, a growing problem with jersey makers, jersey designers. Uh, the NFL has become a brutal victim of this. Of, like, modern, minimalist aesthetic. Where, like... And I don't need, like, gradients. I think gradients on jerseys can look fucking bad. And can look, like, hideous. But there's definitely a healthy middle to be met other than just, like, the Cardinals uniforms. They, they look really sleek. Like, they're cool, but, like, there's no personality to them at all. Uh, the Lions are going to be getting new uniforms here in, like, a month, and it's going to be our first uniform refresh in, like, not a decade, but, like, close to a decade, like eight years. This, the stealth word on what the Lions' uh, new uniforms are going to look like is it's going to look like a modernized uh, 90s. Um, which would be, that is like, talk about like listening to the fans and like really the feedback is like what it's supposed to be. And this was also supposed to be a whole conversation about how I think the league, uh, expanding would actually, uh, it would, it would, again, it would dilute the talent pool in a way and sort of disperse a bunch of assets. But I, maybe I'm thinking about it too hard because what these teams are actually going to end up with is like, like Kyra Lewis and like Quentin Grimes and then what has the experience been with Quentin Grimes in Detroit? Well, he's been hurt. And then if he's not hurt, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't make threes. I thought he made threes. He doesn't play defense. I thought he played defense. He's mainly just been not playing. Okay. All right. That hasn't gone well. You know what I mean? Like, we, it's it's not like these teams are going to, you know, go out and they're going to get, like, Daniel Gafford or something. I think the Mavs would probably protect Daniel Gafford. I don't know. You would have thought that the Pistons would have been able to protect Rick Mahorn. I guess they eh, couldn't do it. Let's move on. This email, I think, is just funny. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, from Mia. Mia, welcome to the show. Subject line, NBA meme players. Hey, Nick. I just wanted to get your opinions on what makes an NBA player memeable. Some examples that instantly come to mind is LeBron to J.R. Smith in the finals, something that we actually talked about in today's show. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, young OKC with the pizza rules, or even Adam Silver with the get ready to learn insert language here. Is it the exposures that players get, or just some players are funnier than others? Thanks for reading. Mia, I think what you're asking me here is like, what what makes a meme a meme? Well, I don't know. How does the how do any of the how does anything become funny? It just kind of does. It just kind of does. You know, such as life with the internet and the the journey that we take. We just like skyrocket screenshots and like. I think if it as it pertains to like modern day shit. I think it has to be like a, almost like a screen cap of something and then something that just could be easily applicable. Like I remember there was a picture like two or three years ago. The Bucks were playing the Pacers and Giannis was like sitting on the baseline with a camera in the middle of a game. And it was a really funny thing, right? And so it was easy to be like, oh, like uh, me when like catching someone in 4K, like doing this and you just a picture of Giannis. Or like Patrick Beverly when he like d took the photographer's camera. Like, I don't know. It just has to be something. I, I don't I don't know. It's just how does anything become funny? Um, you know what I think is the reason I wanted to do, to do this email, though. You know what I think is, is more important is when a player like truly has this transcendent arc when they go from like dude to meme back to dude because it can be so difficult to break that meme shell and i don't know if there's a better player in recent memory who fits this mold more than javel mcgee because when you think about him early in his career and it was like like i guess a serviceable nba player but then once damn shacked and a fool became a thing and every night it was like JaVale McGee! Like, what is Shaq going to say about JaVale McGee? What is Charles Barkley going to say about JaVale McGee? And then Ernie's like, oh, come on, guys. Like, be nice. Like, he's a nice man. Right? And then JaVale goes to Golden State, and we're all like, oh, they got this big... It's like really like the all-meme team, right? And then JaVale actually 
is like he's not, he's like he, like you're talking about transcending transcends being serviceable and he's like a real NBA player for them man like playing real effective big minutes for Golden State in a time where they're like winning champions they're in the middle of a dynasty and we have Javon and it's like this recourse that even Shaq had the take where he's like I I I apologize I wasn't familiar with your game right so I think that's big I'm trying to think anybody anybody off the top of my head that that has sort of broken out of that mold but that's not nothing. You know, and you, hey, you want to talk about it in the worst way? D'Angelo Russell didn't have the best start to his career. It wasn't necessarily because of anything he did on the court. It was because he recorded Nick Young talking about cheating on his famous girlfriend, Iggy Azalea. And then the video, like, gets out, and now D'Angelo Russell is bitch made, and, like, nobody wants to. And then he does, like, a commercial for, like, I think it was Foot Locker where it was, like, NBA rookies and, like, what etiquette is and, like, what it's like in the league and, like, D'Angelo Russell walks in. I think, was Jason Tatum maybe in the commercial? I don't remember who it was. Like, Carl Anthony Towns or something? D'Angelo Russell, like, walks in. He's like, well, first of all, and he, like, rips their phone away and he throws it out the window. He's like, you're, got, he's like, you're not going to need that. Ha, ha, ha. Like, redemption arc for D'Angelo Russell. How often do you hear about that now? When was the last time, before me bringing it up right now, that you heard somebody bring up or even thought about D'Angelo Russell like secretly recording Nick Young talking about cheating on his girlfriend or fiance, whatever their relationship was at the time? It's probably been a while. It's just not really part of the zeitgeist anymore because he had a redemption arc. Hmm, that's not nothing. You know what? And this is an aside. One of my least favorite things about the internet in 2024 is how liberally and loosely people will use the term industry plant. And as soon as somebody skyrockets and, like, you know, comes out of nowhere and is just instantly famous, people will always assume that they're an industry plant. I think I think the psychology of that is people have, like, a they're so conspiracy-pilled nowadays where everything nothing is as it seems and everything is for some sort of a it was sort of orchestrated behind the scenes i think there's just some brain rot that occurs with that and and, and with being on the internet um you know almost terminally in 2024 the reason i take so much issue with it is because it's like did you forget what makes the internet the internet and like sort of what the beauty of it is and it's that like very literally overnight you will go from being nobody to like somebody immediately it happens just like that it happens to thousands of people every single year some on like smaller scales right like you know most of them we don't even hear about but the ones that really that everybody suddenly knows about it, that still happens in 2024. I would argue it happens even more often than it did 15 years ago when, like, YouTube was really starting to, you know, become a thing. Because, well, for everybody's on the internet now. Everybody exists on there, sort of, like, in perpetuity, you know? So it, it's not, it's it's just not as, uh, it, it's simultaneously more challenging than it's ever been to sort of pop off and have that explosion while while also being as unsurprising maybe as it's ever been because even even though it's 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 harder to be recognized and it's harder to get uh you know the algorithm in your favor in some of these instances it's also like well the internet is the town square you know and well sort of the the internet is sort of because it hmm hmm let me work through this it's like Twitter is its own town square and TikTok and Instagram. Although, who, whoa, what's going on with TikTok? I don't know. I feel like people have kind of lost the plot on what the government is actually mad about with that. It's like they don't give a fuck. They like they don't care that it's owned by China. They don't. They care that people are able to farm like the data, the metadata and all your information. And it's for once not them. They don't get a piece of the pie. That's what they're mad about. That's what they're mad about. They don't give a fuck about like, oh, it's China and like, whatever. They don't care about that. It's really easy to sort of drape it in that flag because it makes it seem like it's a national security issue. They're not doing anything on that app that you aren't doing to your own citizens too. You know, it's just because you don't get a piece of the pie. Oh, okay. So, hey, maybe TikTok won't be the town square after a while. I could do it because here's the, my problem is with is this. Because I'm the same motherfucker who will be like, who cares? Ban it. I don't care. 
because like I do the whole attention span thing, which is true. Just objectively, there's an attention span problem um, arising in our youth, right? But I'm also like, we grew up with Vine. Vine was like only six seconds. It was it was demonstrably shorter. And couldn't I have said the same thing? And then the immediate, you know, how I convince myself I'm right is like, well, but Vine was hardly able to get out of its infancy and then they crushed it, like, basically. Not immediately, like, we did have a good lifespan with Vine, but, you know, it, it didn't evolve into something where, A, people could, like, really make money on it. I mean, people have, like, livelihoods on TikTok, right? They, they've they sort of built businesses on TikTok, and that's, this, you know, some of the arguments to of, of the you know people on there, the influencers, to, to keep it around is that, like, hey, man, this is my life. And I know it, it's, uh, for some people out there, really silly, to hear like, well, if TikTok is your life, then like maybe it's time to sort of pivot and reconsider. Um, content is content at the same time. And I don't think that just because maybe you don't understand the value of it or what people are getting out of it, that it's inherently stupid. Um, you know, I, there are people who would argue that I should get a real job. I would agree with them. Most people who do content for a living would agree with you that their job is silly, that their job is nonsense, and that they are very fortunate to get to do what they do. While at the same time, a lot of those people also having real jobs, like also having like labor jobs and like, you know, having to go sit in an office, having to go cook on a line, shit like that. This one really got away from me. It was supposed to be about what makes an NBA player memeable? And it sort of just devolved into like, here's the nature of the internet. I hope that answered the question, Mia. Let's move on. Okay. I need to be honest. Grandma. Grandma, the show's over. Show's over, technically. But we're going to do something else after the show ends, quote unquote. Because I just need to talk to the fellows for a little bit. But I respect you too much to let you hear what I'm going to talk about. Okay? So I'm being serious. The show's over. I'm going to I'm gonna do a fake ending so that my grandma's like, oh, the show's over. I guess I can turn it off now. But stick around, folks, because we're going to do we're going to do something a little bit uh, afterwards. I want to have an adult conversation with everybody. But grandma, uh, you don't need to hear it. OK, mom, you can hear it. It's fine. Whatever. You'll be like, ah, whatever, whatever. But grandma, you, it's OK. You don't need to. So this is the fake ending, but it's the real ending for my grandma. If you are listening to this on Spotify, be sure to rate five stars. If you're listening to this on YouTube, a uh, nice little comment for the algorithm. Leave a like. Be sure to subscribe. And I will catch you guys. Computers now have primary control. Beautiful. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful. All right, Grandma, are you gone? Are you actually gone? Are you still sticking around? Are you still here? All right, I think she's gone. Can we have an adult conversation about smoking weed? So here's what happened. So last night, uh, well, you kind of in the afternoon yesterday, my girlfriend and I were running some errands, and then our weed guy was like, hey, man, I got something for you. And I haven't smoked weed in a long time. It's been a while. Like, really, since my girlfriend's been pregnant, we just, I, I've sort of decided, like, all right, I need to, it's not important to me anymore. Um, I don't need to do it just to be creative or to be, like, well, there are healthy ways to do it. It is, I am one of the people who believes that in 2024, um, it is, like, accessible enough and there is enough of it out there that there is a way to, like, be you know, a, f a highly functioning person who just like smokes a lot of weed. I do believe that those people exist. Um, and I'm not here to like shit on those people. This is like just about me. So I have not smoked weed in a long time, like months and months and months and months. But before that, usually what I would do was it was kind of like a month on and then a month off and then a month on, but it was never crazy. Like it was never really out of control. Um, sometimes it would just be like a little pen or something. Sometimes it would be actual flour, but like I knew what I could handle. Um, you know, sometimes I would just like, Hey, we're going to be spending a few hours doing like some really mundane 
errands like yeah i'll smoke a little bit of weed just to like make it i don't know not suck as much you know i'll be like hey i want to you know think of like you know creatively for like inspiration it's like hey it's a sunday afternoon like we're not doing anything like why don't i smoke a little bit of weed and just kind of hang out and have some fun um like it's never really been crazy right so long story short uh i end up coming into like an eighth yesterday right and i say to my girlfriend i was like is it i go if it's gonna bother you I'm not going to do it. I was like, but if it doesn't, then I will. And she's like, I don't care. Like, go ahead. So I like went outside. I'm not smoking weed inside when she's pregnant. Are you out of your mind? So I like go outside. I do my thing. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, no. I got too high. I got way too high. I didn't even smoke that much. And it was just because it had been so long. I was like, I've eaten today. Like, I'll be okay. I wasn't, dog. Like, it was like six hours that I was just like, what the fuck is going on? And I think I, I kind of just realized, man, like, you know, maybe if I, you know, do it again, like tomorrow or tonight, whatever, like since I, I got that first one out of my system, uh, you know, and I can, I'll be able to remember like, oh yeah, this is how it makes me feel and all this stuff. Like I'll be fine. But I think I'm just at a point in my life now where I just have too much shit going on and I'm like constantly worried about too much to really put myself in a situation where like my senses are heightened and my paranoia goes even like I'm already the most paranoid person in the world. Dog, like somebody knocked on our door a week ago and her and I have like a weird issue with that. Don't knock on our door because I don't nothing's happened to us. Like we're not like a, oh, so someone out to get us. Like it's not like that. We just get like really scared. And like someone knocked on our door the other day and it took me like 30 minutes to relax. And all it was was like somebody just dropping a package off at our door what the fuck huh and i was like for like 30 minutes not like shaking like i was gonna like have a panic attack but i was like there was like a little tremble tremble because my adrenaline was so high like like my flight or my fight or flight kicks in if somebody knocks on our door whatever so because i'm already like the most anxious person in the world the most nervous person in the world they just on top of like hey we're about to be parents like that's about to happen there's just so many there's so much exterior pressure and anxiety that I just don't know if I can anymore. And then and then the biggest part is I don't know if I love how it makes me feel anymore. <laughs> like it's fun. But when I'm just sitting there like stressed out and overwhelmed, but also physically like I'm just like I'm like a I'm just like mush. I'm just in the we've got this brand new couch. It's too cozy. We have all of these like felt and like fuzzy blankets. I'm too cozy, bro. Like, I'm just, I, I feel so dumb and, like, unproductive and, like, stupid. And this was a devastating realization to me that I was like, I'm only 25. I'm, I am, I'm young. And I'm already like, yeah, I don't really want to smoke weed anymore. Like, I don't want to. I don't really want to. If I was in, like, maybe a more social setting where, like, there was zero pressure to do anything at all or, like, any, I don't know, like, just the vibes were just, like, I'm sure it would be fun. But, like, I, I guess I would just rather, like, I don't know. It's like, oh, it's 5 o'clock. Between 5 and 9.30, I'm going to drink three beers, and then I'm going to go to sleep. I think I would just rather do that now. And even then, like, which is funny because that's, that's what yesterday was supposed to be because, hey, it's St. Patrick's Day. I was like, oh, let's pick up some beers. Like, we had to run to Walgreens anyway. So I was like, let's just, I'm gonna, you know, pick up some Miller High Life. And, I, and I did that. And then our weed guy was like, hey. And I was like, well sure it's like he's just congratulating us on the pregnancy all right sure cool yeah i'll take some weed it's funny to me that you're like oh she's pregnant here's some wheat like oh all right literally the nicest guy in the world he's like literally my favorite although yesterday he i like walked into his uh he works at a smoke shop and i walk in and like he was already fucked up it was like noon I'm like okay and he was like uh it's funny. I've been going to this dude for like two years. I, we still don't know each other's names. Still don't know each other's names. Uh, I call him man and he or dude interchangeably. And he calls me brother man. Syrian dude, like amazing. Went to He went to uh, Turkey a couple months ago and he got new hair and he got new teeth. Like he's that bitch now. He looks great. But yesterday I walk in and he's like already fucked up. And he like, you know, fist bump. He's like, brother, man. And he like brings out an eighth. And he's like, I just wanted to say, man, he's like, if you, he's like, if you 
wish me good luck in the world. He's like, this business I have, when it picks up and I have more businesses, you're going to be one of them. Like, you're going to have one of them. I was like, the fuck? I'll, cool. I'll run a smoke shop. Sure, I guess. Like, that's cool. Like, thanks, man. And he was like, yeah, man. He's like, just wish me good luck. And I was like, I, all the luck and all the love in the world to you, brother. Like, from the bottom of my heart. Like, seriously. Like, like thank you. And that was kind of it. Like, that was, all right, cool. I just left with my weed. And I was like, all right, whatever. Our beer was on sale, too. Like, just a lot of a lot of good things were happening yesterday. I, I was only bringing that all up to say. I don't know if... if if some of you out there are like maybe especially I know some I know some of you out there are dads, uh, you know, you've, you've already had a few children, maybe one or two. Uh, some of you are also expecting right now. Are, are you guys also like uh, like like reformed habitual weed smokers? And did you have to kind of find that balance of like because like when he's here and he's born dog like i'm not smoking like i can't do that you can't do that with a newborn I, I can't even you know it's not even like oh well he's he just went to bed like i'll smoke a little bit it's like no i can't i i won't be i'm sure again this is what i'm trying to say is i know some people out there like i'm i'm highly functioning like it is what it is all that happened was you went like eight months without smoking weed and then you finally did again and it just kicked your ass like dude that's all that it is it's not that serious maybe that is all that it is but it was kind of this weird moment where i was like am i just done with this like am i not washed, but like, is it over for me? Like, is this just not what I do? Dog, I was, I was just too high and I felt horrible. I just felt so bad because it's like, I didn't even feel like I could have fun because I was like, well, she can't, it's not like she can participate in this. So all she has to deal with is like this dumbass who's like just too high, you know? And, and we finished watching the most recent season of Love is Blind and like, that was cool. And like, it was, you know, I was, I was extra stimulated, but yeah, I just kind of felt like a loser, honestly. That was too bad. Yeah, I did finally get to see, lived in Chicago for almost five years now. Still have just, I had never seen, for those of you who don't know, the Chicago River uh, for St. Patrick's Day, they dye it green. Like green. Like look up some pictures, look up some videos. If, you, if, you, if you've seen this, if you heard about this, if you don't know about it, look up what the Chicago River looks like on St. Patrick's Day. I have never gotten to see it. Because either we were living too far north and it's like, what the fuck, what am I going to do? Like, just like go outside and go downtown and like go to the, like, no, I don't, I have no reason to go downtown just because. And last night, uh, or not last night, but, but yesterday we, we finally, we had to drive through downtown and they had just done the river dying the day before. I finally got to see it. I finally got to see how cool it looks. It really is that green in person. If not like even somehow more vibrant, like it just really pops. And the thing with the Chicago river is like, you know, if you come here in like August, you're going to be like, hey, the river's green. Uh, Well, there is a little bit of a green hue to it, but it's actually supposed to be green for St. Patrick's Day. It's usually just uh, dirty and gross and like acidic. The amount of people who have like fallen in, they're like kayaking on the river or something and they like fall in or I don't know, whatever. They're drunk on the river walk and they fall in. And it's like, it's like literally like acid. <laughs> Like, you just feel like there's a stickiness to it when you get out, and there's a smell, and it's just fucking gross, which makes sense. I mean, it's, hey, it's a major river in a major city, such as life. Just kind of is what it is. Um, all righty, folks, that is probably going to do it for today's show. If you are listening to this on spot, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Huge announcement. Damn embarrassing of me to forget to do this. Well, I didn't forget to do it. I did remember to do it. I should have done it at the front end of this episode, though. Uh, if you stuck around, I got a little surprise for you. I got a nice little treat. So over on Jacob, a.k.a. Rusty Bucket's second channel, also Rusty Bucket's, uh, the one that I'm editing on, a week ago, I went on their podcast with Rudy St. Clair and Alex Hoops, and the podcast went really well. And I'm here to tell you all, as a fun little announcement, that I will be officially joining their show as a fourth microphone, like permanently. They have signed me to a 10-day contract that I'm hoping to leverage into a Supermax. Um, but yeah, for the, uh, hey, that's, that's, that's just part of the routine now. So it's not going to affect this show at all, uh, like literally at all. But if you are interested in almost getting like a, um, yeah, just more of, Hey, if you're, if you're there for all of us, that's great. But, uh, for, for vanity reasons, if you're, if you don't know who they are, or you really only here to consume my content, 
uh, I would recommend checking the show out because it's a great time. There are three amazing dudes who know more about basketball than I do. Um, the channel is also Rusty Buckets. The podcast is called The Shoot Around. You can check out our episode from last Wednesday. Um, that'll be, uh, yeah, every Wednesday. So it'll be, uh, I'll still be doing my normal Monday and Friday episodes of this show. And then just in, in between, I'll just be doing that show every week too. I will be going on the same like paternity leave hiatus for that show as I, as I am for this um, uh, you know, so we'll get a good number of episodes in the can, uh, before we have to leave. And, uh, yeah, fun little announcement. I will officially be joining, uh, be joining the team over there. Hopefully what happens first? Do they sell that show to somebody like big time, like huge time? Or do I sell the, probably that one, probably, probably that one. Alrighty, folks, if you're listening to this on Spotify, be sure to rate five stars. Uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube, nice little comment for the algorithm. Leave a like. Be sure to subscribe. And I will catch you guys Computers now have in the next Beautiful. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful.